Hi, and welcome to Blue Ridge Online. I'm Mike Kelly, and I'd like to invite you to join me in a time of worship with our worship team. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my way is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me so I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the eye
I love worshiping God through song. And we can continue to worship by giving. And right now you can give online, text to give, or you can even mail in a check. Also, registrations are still open for life groups and care groups. And these are great opportunities to really build community, even in this season. I've got a life group going on Monday nights and the guys are meeting in person. We started this past week and it's been great to see how God is gonna work in and through us over the next few weeks. We hope you'll join us for an in-person service if you're able. We've got services in Bedford at 10 a.m. outdoors, weather permitting. And we've got services at 8.30 and 10.30 at the New London campus. Right now, there's no registration needed if you're coming to an adult service. We do have BR Kids open for kindergarten through fifth grade at the New London campus. We do still ask that you register your kids if they're going to be coming back to be our kids. Please remember to grab an activity pack after any live service you attend or by stopping by the New London campus between 12 and 1 p.m. These packs have a lot of cool stuff, crafts, and daily devotionals for you and your family to go deeper into God's word over the coming week. I'm really excited about the new series that we're starting today, Metamorphosis, a study on Ephesians 4. So let's join Woody in the studio. Isn't that amazing? It's something we're all familiar with, that is the change uh, from the caterpillar to the butterfly. It has a word that's associated with it. Uh, actually, it's a Greek word, even a biblical word, and the word is metamorphosis. And that's what we're gonna be <clears throat> talking about over the next few weeks uh, from a passage in the New Testament. That is, how can we change from what we were and to become something entirely different and new and beautiful. Now, I've seen this in my own life. Uh, many of you have known me for a long time. You know my stories. And so you already know uh, what I'm gonna say. Uh, in my life, there's been a change from what I once was from a caterpillar to kind of a butterfly. Uh, this is not perfect by any means. <clears throat> and those of you who know me know it's not perfect. <clears throat> but for example, I grew up and my language was pretty uh, rough. And so uh, they are, those words are in my neuron pathways and I could hardly talk without using those kinds of words and that kind of language. However, that's not true of me anymore. Now, again, if I hit my finger with a hammer, uh, things come from deep inside of me. Sometimes they're not uh, the things that I would choose. <laughs> but it is so different now. Another uh, thing that you know about me uh, would be some of the stuff as a young man, uh, I, I looked at inappropriate stuff. Since we have families watching this, it is every man's battle, as one author said. <clears throat> the literature and the magazines, and that captured me for a number of years couple of decades probably, <clears throat> but that's no longer a part of my life. How did I get here? And by the way, you may be acknowledging or recognizing some of these things yourself, the way you talk, the stuff you look at, the websites you go on. How do you change? How did I change? Or the way I used the truth or misused the truth. You know, the famous story or infamous story of me trying to cross into Canada and lying about a handgun that I had in the car and being arrested and all that, and God using that to, to change me from someone who misused the truth, played fast and loose with the truth, to someone whom, in whom right now I don't lie. 
I mean, it doesn't mean that there aren't things that are embellished or that I remember differently or forget, <clears throat> but I don't do that anymore. How did that happen? How about you? Is that something you identify with? Or perhaps spiritual dullness. I can remember being in worship services and wanting so badly to feel something, to sense God, but couldn't. And now, at this period in my life, God is more real and more precious to me than he's ever been. I am in some ways more spiritually alive than I've ever been. Or my marriage. Again, you know that the first decade or so of my marriage was one in which both of us, Nan and myself, uh, although we didn't use the D word, the divorce word, there were many times when we'd rather have been out of it than in it. It was a miserable relationship. But that has all changed. You know, some of you, I've told some of you about uh, a number of years ago, an emotional affair. Maybe that's where you are, or maybe worse. But we moved through that. And right now, and I, I don't know how you quantify these things, but I don't know any marriage that I would trade for my own. It is absolutely the best. I wake up virtually every morning. I look over at Nan, and I just say, God, thank you that I get to wake up loving and being loved like this. How did that happen? Because I know what it's like on this side of it. I know what it's like here. I would again say it's not by or due to my self-effort. It is not perfect yet. But this is what God wants for us. How do we get there? How did I get there? Well, that's what we want to talk about as we go through this, uh, this passage <clears throat> Excuse me, that we're going to be looking at. I know, or at least I'm going to assume, that we really want to be different. I mean, isn't that why we go to the gym? Isn't that why we eat in a healthy way? Isn't that why we read self-help books? Isn't that why we go to therapy or to AA or get plastic surgery? We would like to be different and better. We didn't intend to get here. I mean, we didn't, I don't think most of us woke up one morning and said, you know, I'm not a very good parent. I think this year, at the end of this year, I'd like to be a worse parent or to look into the eyes of your wife and say, we've got a good marriage. Why don't we stop working on it and start working toward divorce? We don't do that. We want it to be better. We know that it can be better. And so how do we move toward that? We know the ugliness in us. We know the way we treat, the way we speak to other people, and we want it to be different. We want our spiritual life to be different. One writer, Frank Laubach, said something to the effect, if you're tired of your, you know, your spiritual life, dull, dreary spiritual life, God is even more tired of it. So how can we move from the life that we're living to abundant life? The one Jesus talks about in John chapter 10, verse 10. I came that you might have life and have an abundant life. Well, what it requires, the process is captured by the word metamorphosis. Actually, that word is built around a Greek word, morphuo, or morph. And it just means to change your essence, not just your appearance, but your very essence. Uh, it is a it's kind of a supernatural thing that we'll be looking at. Some of you might remember Years ago, I think it was kind of, a, as I remember it, I was not a child anymore, but it's sort of a cheap uh, series from Japan, the Mighty Morphing Power Rangers. <laughs> and you might remember when they needed to do something extraordinary, they would say, it's morphing time. <laughs> and then something would happen, and they would be different. And that is exactly the picture that we have in the New Testament about what it means to change and how we change. And so, uh, again, this word <clears throat> appears in a number of places. In Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 19, uh, he talks about, I am in uh, like the pains of childbirth until uh, Christ is formed in you, until he is morphed in you. That's our word. And there are other places too, <clears throat> compound words which are made up of this particular word. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed, metamorphosed. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 
And we all, with unveiled faces, that is, uh, we can see some stuff now we couldn't see before if God has given us the ability to see things as they really are supernaturally. We are looking at the glory of the Lord and being transformed. There's a word, metamorphosed, into the same image. That is the image of Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, he talks about we are being conformed to the image of Christ. And that's what he's talking about. We are being transformed, being transformed into the image from one degree of glory to another. That is, we are getting, we are becoming different. We are getting better. We are reflecting God's glory. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, the verse says. And so, how do we do that? Well, the reason I talk about uh, morphing or metamorphosing is because that is a part of the New Testament epistles, the letters that were written to the different churches. Um, For example, we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at the book of Ephesians, starting in chapter 4. Now, I need to tell you a couple of things here about that. Uh, Chapter 4, if you look at chapter 4, you can see that it starts out like this. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, now anytime something starts with therefore, you have to ask a question. What's the question? What's it there for? Because it doesn't make any sense. In other words, there's a logical logical connection to uh, what he's talking about based on what he's already talked about. And so, when he says, therefore, he is referring back to what happened in the first part of the book of Ephesians. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul who's speaking, implore you, urge you to walk, that is to live, he's not talking about just literal walking, to walk in a manner worthy. The word is axios. It's a word which which we get axis. It's, It's the idea of adding weight to a balance. In other words, what he's told us in the first part of the chapter, a book, he's now going to balance it out by telling us what we do as a result of that, how our actions can correspond to what we've learned. Because you see, Ephesians is constructed like most of the epistles. That is, the first part of the book, the the epistle, the letter, is uh, a theological. That is, it tells us what is true. It gives us doctrine. And then... It says, therefore, if these things are true, Romans does it, the first 11 chapters, and then in chapter 12 it says, therefore, I urge you, da, da, da. Or Colossians does it. Ephesians does it too. And what's, uh, what's going on here is, and there's a principle here, is that our experience should be based on our theology, our doctrine, on the truth, not the reverse. That is, Sometimes we establish our theology based off of what we feel, what we experience, what we want to be true. We're doing something, and so we make up stuff. (laughs) We read it back, but we start with what God has said, and that's what I want to do. I don't want to stay here uh, in this passage, but I want to look at what's the therefore, therefore. And so as as we finish up, I want to go back and look at this last, you know, and explore this last word. Therefore, verse chapter four, verse one, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. What is the calling? What is it that God has called us to? Because each of us has a calling. You see, this is uh, something that differentiates those who are followers of Jesus If we follow, it is because we've been called first. In fact, we need to go back and look at chapter 1. We need to do that because if we don't, if we don't, then we will only take chapters 4, 5, and 6, but chapter 4 in particular, we will only take it as uh, these are things we've got to try our hardest to do. And the fact is, let's take the caterpillar turning into the, you know, butterfly. It is not a matter of trying. Now, there is struggle in it. But ultimately, the caterpillar does not try to become a caterpillar. It does not ultimately even try to become a butterfly. This is something that is a part of its very nature, of its DNA. It is the result of some miraculous thing. It can't do what caterpillars do. It cannot become a butterfly unless it, is, it has the DNA of, unless it, it has life, unless it's energized. And that's what we've got to talk about, because if we don't, this will just become another set of 
things that we ought to do, and we will fail. And that's what religion is. That's a definition of religion. And someone, a counselor actually said, you should stop. He talk, was talking to a friend. He said, you should stop shooting all over yourself. That is, we are just shooting. S-H-O-U-L-D. You should do this. You should do that. And that's not enough. And so what is the fundamental truth? What is the therefore that makes uh, the rest of this possible, what we're going to be talking about in the next four or five weeks? What is it that makes it possible? Well, if you will turn back to me, I want to roughly uh, walk through Ephesians chapter 1. Now, there's a lot of other stuff. For example, in chapter 2, it says, it starts with saying, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So we were dead. That is, we are unable to respond. We are unable to grow. We are unaware. Uh, we are dead. And so we need this life. Where does it come from? And unless we understand it and have it, then chapter 4 and following, they will never, ever be something that is actualized in our lives. And so let's go back to chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of <clears throat> Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, the saints is a word, again, that's commonly used, regularly used in the New Testament to refer to those who are followers of Jesus. It is not something that's only applied if you have done two miracles and are dead. It is something which is applied to us. It, the, the idea is it's something set apart. Old Testament, New Testament, something that is holy. Hagias is the Greek word. And basically, it means something that is set apart for holy use, like the utensils in the temple. They were bowls and spoons and they were regular bowls and spoons, except they were sanctified, they were set apart, they were holy. I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, this will be very <clears throat> alien to some of you, but uh, my mother made butter. I didn't go to the store and buy it. She made it. We milked the cows, we churned the butter, and then she would make butter. And after she had churned it, she would take the butter and put it in a mold, and she would and it would have a, you know, usually it would have some kind of decorative pattern and make an impression on it. And then she would set that pound or whatever it was of butter out on the table. Now, in order to do that, to push it into the mold, she used a butter paddle. Now, she had several butter paddles. She had one butter paddle, which she never used for butter. It was up on the refrigerator. And it was used uh, when we would misbehave or whatever. It was set apart. It was for holy use, or at least to make us holy. It was sanctified. And that's what we are, is that we are holy and we are uh, saints. Now, this, these are, now, this happens in real time and space. It happened in Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the best. No, I mean, I, I haven't been there several. I love the place. I've been there several times. And I love walking down the streets. It is, you know... It, it's not completely excavated by any means. The hills are full of places, you know, just ruins. But you can walk down the same streets that Paul walked down. You can go to the same, you know, synagogue that he probably was in. You can go to an amphitheater which holds 25,000 people. And you can, you can be in the very same. And this was a mother city. I mean, it was like New York or London. It was a large city. It was right on, a, on the intersection of the trade routes. It had a wonderful harbor, which is now silted in, but then uh, received ships from all over the known world. Paul, we meet, you know, we meet the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19. You know, cool story. Go read Acts chapter 19. Uh, and Paul's encounter with a magician there. And, and, uh, and anyway, it's a great story. <clears throat> Basically, he, he wants to buy Paul's power to heal people. And then he goes and uh, he says, you know, tries to use it. Paul doesn't sell it to him. He tries to use it and it doesn't work for him. In fact, he goes to some demons, tries to cast them out. And they say, I know Paul. I know Barnabas, Apollos. I know all these guys. I don't know you. And so they jumped on him. And these demonic beings, and they gave him a whip and said that they beat his clothes off him. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you get your clothes beaten off of you, you just had a beating. And, and so, but people went on to burn their, you know, their books, magicians' books worth 
th hundreds of thousands of dollars. Anyway, fast forward 30 years, we, we have this book of Ephesians that Paul's writing, we're looking at right here. Fast forward another 30 years, we're in uh, the book of Revelation, and it's the first of the seven churches. By this time, they've lost their first love. But here, in, you know, when Paul is writing, they were known for their, you know, their love for God. And Paul spent three years here. Uh, <clears throat> you, you can read uh, about his teaching from the school of Tyrannus, and, and, so, you know, and on it goes. So this is a, a major city, a hub from which the gospel went out. And he says, so this, this is to the saints who in Ephesus are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace, and I, I just have to stop here, because grace is, it's in the, uh, off, you know, and really the offertory in the uh, introductory comments to almost all of the uh, epistles, and because grace is that which differentiates Christianity from any and every other religion. Grace, to give you a, a maybe uh, hopefully, a, you know, a definition you can use is, you know, it's unmerited favor. In other words, we don't have to do anything to deserve it that God gave it. To, it is God doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. It is the key for the change that has been in my life. It did not come from my self-effort and my native ability. It came from the grace of God. Grace to you and peace, that is peace with God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father. I want you to notice the things that are said here because you see, in order for us to be metamorphosed, we have to acknowledge and to embrace and to understand these things that he's saying here. And these are things that God does. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us, in Christ, I want you to notice, in Christ is used 27 times in this book. It really captures the essence of the gospel. When I came to Christ many years ago, one of the first things I remember is the person uh, who had a blue glass bottle, and they took a white piece of paper and put it down the bottle, and they say, when you come to Christ, you're placed into Christ, so that when you look, when you look at this piece of white paper, it looks blue. When you're placed into Christ, when, G when God looks at you, he sees you through Jesus. He sees you as Jesus is seen. And so this in Christ, it's a hundred, he uses 169 times, 27 times in this, uh, in this particular epistle, this particular letter. And so he says, uh, he chose us, that is, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before we ever were conscious, aware, we, God chose us. It was his initiative before the foundation of the world. And he did it so we would be holy. There's their word again, hagios, the saint word, and blameless before him. Look at this. In love. So here's the context. In love, God predestined us for adoption. He predestined, that is, he made the choice before we ever made the choice. In love, though, it was motivated by and in, in, or surrounded by his love. In love, he predestined us for what? Adoption to himself. Now, in the Roman world, adoption was more often of adults than it was of children. It was oftentimes because someone did not have an heir, and they would, you know, they would look around and they would, or maybe they have, a, maybe their heir, their son or whatever was not, you know, they knew that it wouldn't work to leave their stuff to him because of what he would do with it and who he was. And so they would look around for somebody who was, you know, that they could adopt. And when they adopted this person, everything that they were, their name, their identity, their debts, everything was erased. It was done. And they took on the authority and the identity and the inheritance of the one who adopted them. And so God uh, adopted us, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, there's that word again, with which he has blessed us in the beloved or in Christ. See, that word just keeps showing up. In him, there it is again, in him we have redemption. The word apolutrosis is one of the words here. That's the Greek word. It just means ransom. And we know what ransom is, that a, a payment is made so that a person who is in captivity, who is in danger, 
can be delivered from that captivity. And so we were ransomed through his blood. We were forgiven the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his what? His grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Let me just finish up with a couple more verses here in chapter one. In Jesus, there it is again, in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that's the word of truth, you were, and, and you, you heard it, you believed it, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That is, uh, you, when someone sealed something in the, in the New Testament, you've seen it, perhaps, when someone sealed a document, a scroll, a letter, or whatever, they would finalize it, then they would put hot wax on it, and then the, the author of it, the king, whoever it was, would take his signet ring and make an impression in that wax. When I was, you know, and so it was his, it had his imprimatur on it, it was secure, they would know it had not been, you know, nothing had been lost, and that's what, that's what he's talking about, the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is to seal us. And so, um, when I was working, in, when I was in graduate school, uh, I worked on freight docks, and we would, every tra trailer that came in would have a seal on it. When it left, we would have to put a seal on it, and you could not get them, uh, you know, you could not undo them. They had to be cut off. And the reason was they would, the people who received it would know that nothing had been uh, trifled with, stolen, uh, messed with. And so he says the Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation, of our relationship, the guarantee, the down payment of our inheritance. We get an inheritance. All of these things are true of us, according to uh, this passage. Now, I don't know where you are, or I mean, this is just words, but I wanna make it more than that. Here's what I wanna do. And you can, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna read back through these and summarize it. And then I'm gonna have you make the statement and make it as a personal statement. Some of you will make this statement with joy and certainty because you know it's true. Others of you, uh, not, I don't know. Can I really say that? Others of you say, that's not true of me at all. And if you're in the latter two categories, there is a wonderful, wonderful invitation here that Jesus is saying, I want you to recognize, to acknowledge that you have been chosen, you have been adopted, that you have been sealed, that you have an inheritance. All these things are true of you. How, and you say, well, how do I know? It's if, if, you, if you've come to the place where you have acknowledged that you don't have this or you're not sure of this and that you cannot achieve it on your own, that only God can do it, then you can know that it's true and you can appropriate it if you say it with joy and certainty and, and, and belief, trust in it. Now. There are others of you, as I said, who maybe can't say, what an opportunity for you. I would invite you, God would invite you to say that I want this to be true of me. I can't say it. I don't know that it's true of me. I want it to be true of me. And so as we go through this, use it as a sort of a, a litmus test for you. And so I'm gonna state, restate what we've just read. And I want you to state it out loud, wherever you are, just state it out loud. Maybe you're by yourself, maybe you're with some other people. And if this is true, say it. If not, it might be a comfort, it would be a conversation to have with other people, maybe with yourself. And so just say this after me. <clears throat> Number one, I am chosen by God. Wouldn't you just repeat that? I am chosen by God. Is that true of you? I am <clears throat> holy and blameless before him. I am holy and blameless before him. I am adopted through his son. Say it with me. I am adopted through his son. I have all of the privileges, the rights, and the standing that Jesus has. I have received his grace. Say that with me. I have received his grace. It is a gift. I am redeemed or ransomed. I am redeemed, ransomed. Say that with me. I am redeemed or ransomed. I am forgiven of all my sins. I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future. I am forgiven. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've experienced the Holy Spirit. Other people see it. I know. I am aware of the Spirit in me. I have seen the changes. I have an inheritance. Say that. I have an inheritance. 
See, these are the truest things about you. These are the things about you, which if they're not true and you're just trying to do Ephesians 4, will never work. But these are the things that are true of you. And these are the things that we will base everything else that we talk about in the next four or five weeks on. And so the question becomes, are these things true of me? Because this is how you come to life. This is how you become a caterpillar. <laughs> and in the caterpillar, in the DNA of the caterpillar, is everything else that will eventually uh, emerge as we can become a butterfly. And so here's what I want you to do. Uh, in fact, let, let's practice. Since you're used to talking about Leo, let's just practice this. I'm going to say with the mighty morphing Power Rangers, it's morphing time, and you say, we shall morph indeed. So I'm going to say, it's morphing time, and you repeat, or you respond, we shall morph indeed. Say that with me. We shall morph indeed. Now, I want you to say that this week. And here's when, when you come up on places where you're talking, acting, thinking in ways that you become aware of not being what is true of a butterfly, not being uh, true of what is a, a saint, a follower of Jesus, then I want you to say, indeed, I shall morph. Indeed, I shall morph. Or I shall morph indeed. And if you do, here's what happened. You know, because of the morphing that's taken place in my life, as I've already said, not perfect, but I have touched people in places, gone places, figuratively, even physically. I never would have gone. I have drunk deeply of the sweetness of relationships and of life itself. I have been used by God to sort of, uh, if you will, be uh, a part of people's uh, movement toward Him, their spiritual germination, if you will. I've been able to carry, and you can too, I've been able to carry the, the pollen of the gospel to other places and other people. I have felt the sun on my wings. Oftentimes, um, it's true, I have been in the shade and the shadows, but I have felt the sun on my wings. I have from time to time had people look at me and say, I see the beauty of God in you. I have gone to places. I have sensed things. I have, in some cases, displayed the beauty of God to the world around me. That's what God wants for you. So how does it happen? It happens through metamorphosis. It happens when we say, I shall morph indeed.
me, I'm a child.